So picking up where we left off, we were talking about how John Adams and Abigail Adams letters are celebrated as one of the best examples of epistolary literature. Now, that word epistolary comes from uh, the noun form epistle. An epistle is just a, a very fancy word that we got from Latin, but originally from Greek. That's where the Romans got it from. That means letter. And if you have a lot of familiarity with the New Testament of the Bible, you probably recognize the word epistle. Uh, a, a lot of the New Testament is devoted to Paul's epistles to the Ephesians or the Corinthians or other different uh, geographical groups that he was uh, speaking to and also proselytizing to. Now, these would be epistolary nonfiction literature because they represent, you know, real life events that happened to John and Abigail Adams. It's not made up. I mean, epistolary literature can also be fiction. And what that looks like is a novel of sorts that is written just as letters to and from each other. And some of the earliest examples of novels in English do that. Uh, for example, uh, the novel Clarissa does that, and I believe that is an 18th century novel. Might even be late 17th. Very, very long, and it's all letters back and forth. It is a brick. It's huge. Not my thing. But uh, it, it is an important way of understanding a broader definition of what literature is. After that, finally, we will be reading Thomas Paine, if you haven't read him already. Very important figure. Quite dashing in this picture. Now, he is among the youngest of the founding fathers. He comes to America from England at the age of 37, right before the revolution starts. But he is on board with the cause, big time. And he is known in American literature for being the most persuasive writer for the cause of independence. In other words, his writings had the most profound reading influence on making people believe that independence was a, a really good idea, or at least the best idea out there. And one of the reasons for that is his writing style. It's simple, it's straightforward, it uses uh, a diction or word choice that is very accessible to a very wide range of readers. It uses syntax or sentence structure that is straightforward, but it also does use visual, uh, very vivid figurative language. You know, he, he compares uh, the British Empire to being a terrible parent. Um, he, he compares the colonies, using figurative language, as uh, a person that is being plundered or ravaged or raped even by the British Empire. High emotional content in places, but he also does lay out logically um, why it is the best thing. Oh, look, I was way ahead of my bullet right there. It's a very plain style, but it's very, very powerful. He also was very good at using parallel structure, where the first part of a sentence mirrors the second part. Common Sense was a pamphlet that came out, um, probably his most famous work, and it really does lay out the reasons for independence and revolution, including justifying the violence that will come because of it. Now, this pamphlet was distributed, distributed widely, and because of its distribution, people really got a better sense of what is at stake in American independence and why they should be on board with it.
Now, his other very, very large uh, influential piece is Age of Reason. It didn't have quite the same popularity as Common Sense, but it too was very, very popular. And it does put forward in greater detail this idea of deism as a spiritual belief system. And he talks about um, how revelations may be true for one person, but not necessarily for anybody else. Um, and he also casts skepticism on the notion of miracles. But he does go back to those enlightenment ideas and those deist ideas of compassion and reason um, and understanding of the natural world as the way to do your diligence to God and to the people around you. Now, because of all of this, um, he doesn't really identify as strongly as a Christian as some of the other writers. But a lot of the Founding Fathers were very broad in their Christianity, if they could even be called contemporary Christians by our definitions at all. And he, like Thomas Jefferson, like Benjamin Franklin, talk about the importance of there being a diversity of religion and that people should be able to worship however, they're, however they please, and the government should take no part in that. This is a really, really uh, revolutionary concept at the time, and it's one that really does change the way people look at the relationship between government and religion in the West. Now, um, we're in a, we are in a, an election year right now, and... Whenever an election year comes around, it's not uncommon to see people using the Founding Fathers as support. And sometimes they will do it in terms of religion. You know, the Founding Fathers wanted this regarding religion. The Founding Fathers wanted that. Now, a lot of times these claims are not fully accurate because their understanding of religion is much broader and much more inclusive and much more separated from government and government agencies and government officials than these people that are using them during uh, political campaigns would have you believe. So that's something very, very important to keep in mind. It's a fascinating read. We're way ahead of his time, um, but it, The Age of Reason did earn him a few adversaries, if not outright enemies. Uh, it's good for you to good for you to look at. Also talks about the Pythagorean theorem at, at one point, so that's a solid as well. Now, oh, that's right. I have a an interesting video for you to watch. That in a contemporary sense sheds light on what the deists thought about religion and its fracturing and fragmenting into many different um, subcategories and different denominations and how those denominations at times seem to be more about promoting themselves than about being, you know, a person who was acting in the best interests of serving God or showing empathy and compassion to their fellow human beings and more of the flavor of this denomination is right and that one's going to hell because. Um, so here's kind of a lighthearted take on it from a comedian who was really big in the 80s um, but now uh, is he's still around but kind of more under the radar unless you're a real kind of stand-up comedy geek and you follow him. He's, he's got some funny stuff. He, he does a lot of one-liners. Um, he has this very interesting persona that in some ways does look antiquated. You can tell by his hair and the way he dresses, uh, dresses you know, off the bat, that there is something uh, out of time and out of space about him. But I'm going to post that, that link uh, on our Week 7 uh, Learning Materials module, too, so you can give it a fun look. 
apologize for the video quality. It's very, very bad. Um, you can handle it. I also apologize for the subtitles at the bottom. I don't think there's any way to take them off. Um, the good news about it is that the subtitles aren't in Italian. So if you want to pick up a little uh, romance language practice while you're viewing the clip, hey, knock yourself out. Thanks for watching and I'll see you again real soon. Make sure you email me or text me if you got any questions. Do keep in mind that, you know, the uh, rough draft for essay number one has been extended to Saturday, October the 3rd, 11.59 p.m. If you have an idea from discussion or kind of past interaction who you'd like to be your peer, go ahead and send me a message. Uh, I'll be happy to accommodate you. Thanks again, and I'll talk to you soon.